praise the living Lord. Praise the living Lord. Praise God. This is the day that the Lord has made for me and for you, and we are going to have a sharing. I am not going to preach today, because the vice chancellor was saying, if I have a PowerPoint presentation, how am I going to do it? Is it a lecture? Now, it is a sharing. Call it a reflection, and you call it a teaching. Go ye into the world, baptize, teach, and also preach. But I'm going to teach, and I'm going to be very brief. So maybe I'll blend in some biblical examples that bring in the niche of preaching, which most Anglicans like most. But I think mine is going to be more of teaching and a sharing so that I provoke you to go and think more about the subject matter. My name is Reverend Canon Aaron Mwesije. I am uh, an alumnus of this university from 1985. From, I, I want you to hear the years, from 1985 to 1991. Six years intensive and rigorous here. Uh, so you see, so you see, I know all the corners uh, as far as this very good place is concerned. Some of you are very new here, even the administrators, but I can see my old friends here, whom we played football together. Remember our class was only 40 students in a class, 40, one, two, three, up to 40. For you are so many. So in other words, we ate everything together. We managed to eat bread and butter and eggs. Ah, oh, it was in a small, in a small dining hall and then in a small uh, library, but we actually consumed whatever stuff that was there in the library, and, I, and we enjoyed. Bishop Joel Obieta, you know, Dr. Muhindo, Edison, I know them, all of them. Professor Biaruhanga, you see, I'm not even looking at them. <laughs> you know, these, are, these guys you see here, I actually had an opportunity. I think Professor Biaruhanga was one of our pioneers for our degree program, which was not Uganda Christian University degree. It was actually uh, for theological institutions of Eastern, not even East Africa, but Eastern Africa. So my topic today is what I do. Because I thought it wise that when I come here, I should actually share with you what I do. And I am working as a director in the Directorate for Ethics and Integrity, Office of the President in charge of religious affairs. Director of Ethics, as you can see my title there. And in fact, as I'm going to be reading here, because I'm teaching, I am not going to preach. So as I read, you read. So I want to request someone managing my, my uh, clips, my slides to manage them. When I mention a, a heading, then you go. So start, go to the problem, the problem. Now I want to blend the problem with the background. The reason is, is there a problem for me to discuss ethics and integrity at this time? Why ethics and integrity at this time? Why? In a university where you have students and staff, and I want to be specific, university. Ethics and integrity is meant for the entire society, just from family up to where you are. But this time, I am going to discuss it in the context of a university where you have staff and lecturers. But I want to give you a problem that actually drives me to come up with those two words, ethics and integrity. Uganda, as you hear, if you are not aware, is a young nation in the whole world, youngest, if you are not aware. Uganda, and take note of that, with a median age below 16 years. But at the same time, God gave it a lot of wealth and a lot of resources. Now, the nations of the world, including Uganda, including Uganda, welcomed this century, this one where we are in, with great aspirations and ambitions. There were and still are great expectations for breakthroughs in developments in the fields of economics, those of you here are doing economics, in the fields of science and technology. What is sadly missing in all these plans is the forgotten fundamental element in all human development, which is the character and morality we desire for our future. The economic, scientific, technological development goals all address what we want our nations and people to have in the future. These goals include good roads. You see, our president always talks of 
the social and economic infrastructure. Good roads, industries, strong economies, scientific breakthroughs, name them. Some of the scientific advances may not necessarily benefit humanity in the foreseeable future, but they do contribute to national identity and pride. What many of the leaders, including our leader, President Museveni, in this century are not addressing is the fundamental question about the kind of people we want to become in future. What is lacking in our plans, including at UCU, in our curriculum, as far as staff and students are concerned, for the future is the moral vision. Ironically, the issues of character and morality have a direct bearing on economic and technological development. The key to a nation's development lies in the character of its people. In other words, there is a direct connection between morality of a society and its survival. You can quote that. So your character is your personality, especially how reliable and honest you are. If someone is of good character, you are reliable and honest. If you are of bad character, you are not respected. Go to definition of words and phrases. Now, ethics is precisely a set of principles on the rightness or wrongness of free human conduct. Such a principles highlight what we consider as right conduct or wrong conduct. That's ethics. Ethics drives our individual or group behavior and guides our daily moral living. To be ethical, therefore, is to do the right thing what is universally acceptable and shun doing wrong. The biblical ethics, if I may borrow a leaf from there. Biblical ethics is the moral principles that govern how you live based on God's word as found in the Bible. Biblical ethics attempts to explain what the Bible teaches about God's will for how his people ought to live, the moral choices they, they should make, it is see. And I can give examples and examples, because, but because of time, I'll limit myself to Joseph, whom you know in the Genesis, when Potiphar's wife approaches him, he wants to, he actually enticed him <laughs> to have a sexual affair with him, and yet he was interested in being in charge of the entire household of, uh, of, his, of his master. Joseph refused. I don't know how many of us would refuse, would survive, a woman's enticement into sexual affair. How many of us here? Either way, either a man's enticement or a woman's enticement. Joseph is an example. Another one is Shadrach, Abednego, Mesach. You can read that one in, in Daniel. I'm not going to, but lastly and most important is Jesus. You recall when he was tempted in Matthew 4, he had to quote the scriptures. You see, so he had to overcome that temptation by quoting what was written in the scriptures and therefore he lived that life of integrity and displayed it. Remember as much as he was God, he was a human being. So integrity, what is integrity? Integrity is the quality of individual members of society that have excelled in observance of ethical standards. Now I don't want to go in details. I just want to give you now what is the difference between ethics and integrity in practical terms. Ethics, as I said, is the principles that guide behavior. You see? If you go in a family, some families have ethical principles that they live. If you go in a university, you have core values that you live. If you go in anywhere in an office, you find on the, on the wall core values of this institution, a director to a ministry. Now, ethical principles that so ethics are principles that guide behavior, that guide society. And integrity, therefore, is living or exercising those principles. You put them into practice. That's integrity. So a man of integrity is one or a woman who is ethically grounded. So when you are ethically grounded, that means you have integrity. The quality of being honest is integrity. Now, honesty is an ethical principle. You see, honesty is an ethical principle. So integrity 
is living that ethical principle. And that is why I say that integrity is being honest or the quality of being honest. So when, when, when you carry out the ethical principles in your daily life and daily activities, then you are a, a very a man or a woman of integrity. Now I go to moral, moral uh, values in educational institutions. And uh, now actually that should be importance of moral values in society. But I just bring in educational institutions because I'm addressing an educational institution. Just as a nation needs sound structure infrastructure, as I said, actually a lot of money, you people who are here, especially uh, the, the lecturers and students who are focused, because you know focus of students begins even at primary level. You don't have to go to university in order to be focused. You see, and that is why people who are not focused even at university level, you will want to get a job because even when he finishes or she, he wants a job. You ask him what do you want to do, he said, I, wa I want a job. I, want, I can do anything. So you can't do anything. You have to do something. That means someone who can do anything is someone who is not focused. So someone who is focused is one who knows what he or she wants in life. And that is why we are dying with unemployment in this country, because our educational system does not lead us to focus. And focus begins right from our homes, where we interact with our parents. You need to know what you want to do. And in the world, in the first world countries, people don't actually get jobs to work for government. And here we are casting government because of unemployment. There is no country in the whole world, including the father of democracy, which is America, that can boast of employing all its citizens. In fact, in the first world countries, when people finish university, they do their own things because they are focused. Few people who go for government are only those who are politicians. <laughs> but if you are not a politician, you don't want to work for what? Working for government to give you what? But you see, focus is very, very important, and it doesn't take you to go to university to be focused, although it can add value to your focus when you go join a university. So as I said, President Museveni and his group and his cabinet, and I've worked with the office of the president for some time. Their focus is roads, houses, buildings, hospitals, you know, airports, universities, name them. You know that. That is where most money is spent as far as the national budget is concerned. I want you to listen to this carefully. Just as a nation needs sound structural infrastructure such as that that I've mentioned, which is social economic infrastructure, a nation also needs sound and strong moral values infrastructure, what I may call the moral infrastructure of a nation. So there's a difference between economic infrastructure and social infrastructure and moral infrastructure. And I'm going to explain what that means. Experts in economy and development agree that the development take place of a nation. Actually, if you want to hear the words of George Washington, the first president of America who died at the age of 67, and who led in America to become independent in, in 1776, he said, and I quote, the love of my country will be the luring influence of my character, character, character. Now, where leaders lack character, and you talk of development, it will be half-baked, and that's what you see in this world. So listen to this, experts in economy. For any development of a nation to take place, you need to apply the tangible assets as well as the non-tangible assets. Now, in economics, the tangible assets are the roads, capital, you see, are the physical buildings, those are tangible assets that you can see. Actually, people here, when they want to do investment, they invest in those assets, tangible. Roads, hospitals, capital, land, natural resources, and what have you. While the non-tangible assets are values, morals, that motivate people to utilize the tangible assets appropriately and profitably. In other words, without the non-tangible assets, you cannot appropriately, you cannot profitably utilize the tangible assets. That's why engineers produced with first class. Paul Waswa here, your chaplain, by the way, is an engineer who blends engineering and with the gospel. You are very lucky to give God a big hand clap to have him. But he will agree with me 
that that university called Makira has produced so many engineers, and some of them are civil. They are building roads and this. But how many you've heard on TV? Buildings collapsing. And by the way, engineers put there their hands and their intellect. Yeah? A lot of architectural designs and civil engineering works on the roads, and they are short the work. You now, what is you see what is lacking in that? Morals. None tangible. So the tangible assets are being constructed by people who lack ethics and integrity. And therefore, you will end up having structural infrastructure, yes, but where there are no, where, where there, is, there is lack of appropriate work that is done. And that is why there is shoddy work and buildings are collapsing. So today's emphasis, that's why I'm challenging and challenging myself, students and staff. Today's emphasis is put on tangible assets. Even here in this university, if you give the vice chancellor, you ask the vice chancellor, what is it that you want as an assistant? We'll tell you, I want, I want money to build this and this, you see? Either it is computer infrastructure, IT infrastructure, it's all those nine. But when it comes to non-tangible assets, literal effort is put there. No money, by the way, between me and you. If you go to the national budget of Uganda, I don't think that it, as far as the budget is concerned, there is less money that is given in rebuilding ethics and integrity for this country, which is the moral infrastructure of our country. And that is why there is a problem. So it is on the foundation of non-tangible assets that the tangible assets are applied, resulting in economic and other positive national developments. So moral values in institutions of learning is an essential tool for national development but this requires carrying out a moral revolution of the entire society. This moral revolution involves cultivating positive character values among the citizens. You hear at Makerere, the brigades, the militant brigades at Makerere. You know recently your student died in Makerere during elections. What kind of students are those? And these are future legislators. Of course, you saw in parliament at one time, the tables being overturned in parliament the first parliament I have ever seen in, this, in the whole world behaving like that. Because people have to oppose one another in parliament, even in England, there's a house of commons. And, but you see the kind of character that people live, which stems from kindergarten, even at family level and primary schools, and then you end up in parliament, and you are, these are the legislators that you sing. Because what happened in Makere, killing your student, your student from here? It can happen here, can happen, and it has happened. And you know, the council sits, and the university council sits and then stops those, uh, those, those, those. I think those are just, those are symptoms. Vice Chancellor, you should know that even when you sit and stop those elections, it doesn't work. We are only treating symptoms, but not the underlying causes. There's a need to sit down and say, what is wrong with our society? What is wrong? That is why I say I am calling for a moral revolution as President Um7 and Company Limited started the war in the name of NRA, and they call it National Resistance Movement, I think we need a moral revolution in this country. The best tool of carrying this moral revolution is through carrying out character moral education through families, through schools and universities. Let me quote Douglas Frederick, one of the greatest scholars, he said, and I quote, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And let me tell you something. We have been busy in this country repairing broken men. That's why you have the IAGG, you have the DPP. You know, they just arrest these people who have taken the money, repair, trying to repair broken men. By the way, when you repair a broken man, you'll break again. I'm telling you, and the second breaking will be even worse than the first one, by the way. We need to bend on training, on building strong children, right from family. This is what I'm calling for. If we could start it at UCU, and I'm telling you I'm ready to support. Now, don't ask me how we are going to do it. That is very easy because you have to sit down and design a package. You have lecturers here who can actually work out that passage. The country has spent more resources on repairing broken men and less emphasis has been put on building strong children with good character through moral education. In Uganda, having witnessed the success of universal primary education under NRM, it is now 
necessary to start. Vice Chancellor, listen to this. This is for your VC forum. It is now necessary to start and carry out the third initiative. As a country, you have done universal primary education, not even to its adequacy, and the secondary universal education. I am calling for another third initiative of universal moral education. This is a calling that I'm making. We need knowledge for these students of how to live with nature so that you don't destroy nature. Actually, students are terrible. They destroy. Imagine you are in a, a school like this one. Makere University is a very good example. Chambogo is another one. You know them. You know what? Actually, thank God that you are a university of excellence. Give God a big hand clap. Huh? People are students, and they go and destroy labs. They destroy buildings. They burn them. And tomorrow, the, these are the buildings where their children are going to study grand, grand, grand. Hey, banange. Are we safe in this country? Do you now imagine that, that you, you don't have that. You can't even think that if I destroy this lab, first of all, we are a third world country, a third world country. The small that we have now, we are destroying it. Now in the future, and, that, and you are there to produce these Ugandans, how they produce, you know? More than even. And we produce and produce and produce. And these children, where are they going now to study? You have destroyed when you are at Makerere. And you end up, of course, in where? Because these best eloquent speakers who are at Makere campaigning are the ones who end up in your parliament. And you vote them as legislators tomorrow. And what kind of legislation are they going to make? It is high time as a country that we think of spending money on supporting universal moral. Now, don't ask me the package. It is very easy to do it. And some schools and universities have that. But we can add a niche in it. So we need knowledge of how to live with nature. Knowledge of how to care, knowledge of, of how to share, knowledge of how to be human. <laughs> because someone who is, not, who is human cannot kill a, human, a fellow human being. You know, you, you, you pick a, bo a, broken, a, broken, a broken bottle and you kill a fellow student, and you are a human being. So we need knowledge of how to be human. Bananga, we are not human in this country, we self, starting with universities. I'm telling you, what happened in Makere the other day should be an eye-opener for lecturers in universities, for students in universities, that it doesn't happen again. It is a shame. It is a disgrace. It is disheartening. The weakening of spirituality and the rise of materialism, the rise of immorality and introduction of man-made morals, the attack on the institution of marriage, where you have pastors divorcing their wives, and then they even he exposed them in public, how even they, they, they do the, what I may call bedroom revival. Ah, my friend, it's terrible. You, you know, and then some of you, when you finish, you go to those pastors, and the whole tent becomes filled, and you clap hands for the pastor. Who has broken marriage relationship? And marriage, by the way, this is a God-given institution, those of you who want to marry. It's not man-made. Banange katunda so this is a serious issue. In all these and many others, the helplessness of children and their vulnerability puts them in great dangers. Moral education must take precedence over sciences and book learning. This is Julius Nyerere, one of the great African uh, leaders. He said, and I quote, for unless the character be trained, acquiring knowledge will only prove injurious. That's powerful. And that is what it is now. So just acquiring knowledge will prove injurious. That's not me. These are not my words I'm quoting, and I think I'm not suffering from plagiarism because I, I just make quotes, you see. Some of you don't quote. You just mention them as if they were words. Where do we begin? And I end there. We should begin with schools and universities. Imparting moral values relies on oral modeling and interaction. Listen to this. Words and texts remain ink and paper unless translated into deeds and actions. Teachers must teach by example, whether you like it or not. That's where we should begin. There is a need for a unified moral instruction in kindergarten and pre-primary institutions. Need for robust ethical training manual 
from kindergarten to the university level. We can develop those manuals, Banang. But you see, Uganda is very, very famous at developing policies and manuals, and then they are not implemented. So many, Banang, But you see, when we spend money in implementation, and the government wakes up and says, wait a minute, Minister of Education, and thank God that we have the first lady. I hope she will not retire before she, and she's born again. I think it's even a challenge on her. I don't know if she's aware. She might even not be aware, by the way. But I think we can make her aware about this. But you see, it's hard to meet her even. Some of us die. You spend, I don't think that such a writing, I just woke up and wrote. I had to do research, by the way. And I wrote and sat and wrote. But you see, it is wasted. Because I'm sharing, but thank God I'm sharing with you. And at least you can get out something. So that when you become uh, family people, and some of your families, you can do something. We can actually start even at family level. Yes, why not? We can start at family level. So that before you, you join a university, you are ethically grounded. You know how to live. You know how to share. You know that this is a fellow human being. You don't disregard any friend of yours. So what the biggest challenge in higher institutions, which you people know, drug abuse, alcoholism, immorality, pornography, sexual abuse, cheating in exams. Oh, let me mention that one also. That's an animal. Students and teachers who are products of a system of examination malpractices for purposes of passing exams are easily compromised. Lack self-esteem, lack creativity and innovativeness, lack focus. You even lack freedom of thought. Let me tell you people who are products of cheating. And I'm telling you the truth. Some of us, we are lucky. I am 67 years old. Guess my exams at all level. It was from Cambridge to East African Examination Council. Professor Yaranga, am I lying? Cambridge exams, East African Examination Council. Now, UNEB, I'm sorry to say. Products of UNEB, I'm sorry, I am not saying you, you they are not, and by the way, let me tell you, we still have geniuses in this country under UNEB, but the geniuses have been compromised by the system. Because everyone has to pass exams. During our time, I recall vividly at my olive, I couldn't balance my grades. You have a four here, you have a five here, you have a seven here. But I have two degrees now, actually, with so many postgraduates. So you, it, see, my lecturer, you recall at the University of Leeds, he said, success is not the ability. No, he said success is the ability to move from one failure to another without losing courage. So you see, success is not, is not moving from one success. It is the ability to move from one failure. In other words, along the journey to success, there is failure. But I'm telling you, educational system of Uganda doesn't want people to fail exams. Banange, you see, Chitende St. Mary's, all 100 out of 100. <laughs> Products of Chitende, please don't, don't kill me. I know they are here. I am telling you that is a fake educational system. By the way, I'm a teacher by profession. It's a fact. Where all people pass exams and all of them are 100 out of 100 and in Division 1, that's dangerous. People have to pass, others have to fail. But failing exam is not an end in itself. Let me tell you the truth. Success in examination is not the one that leads someone to become successful in life. No way. And you guys have excelled because of the poor UNEB system, and you have passed with flying colors, first class, second class, and you end up on the street. You have no jobs. And you are looking for jobs in where? In government. And the government has no money to employ you, no space. Because you are not focused. It is the examination system that is actually making you incapacitated, intellectually incapacitated. You, the focus is only passing exams. Ay, 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 then you see these schools. Set a high school, all of them. How do people? Then we begin to ask ourselves, some of us, our parents, and who, of course, studied. You mean for us, we were not, we were not all that? We were so stupid like that? All of people passing exams, Division One, Division One. Of course, I'm sorry, me, I'm very bold when I talk. You know, I'm very, I'm very. You have to accept my word. The current, the current Minister of State for Higher Education has many schools, and most of his schools, I don't want to mention his name, 
most of his schools are the ones even which excel, I'm telling you. They are the ones the number one. So is that a conflict of interest? I don't know. That's uh, for your future. <laughs> Conclusion. Are we concluding? Yes. Now, there I bring in the biblical component, and I'm not going to read the Bible. You can read it on your own. Titus 2, 6, 8. It says, remember I'm teaching ethics and integrity. Although I have digressed, but that is intellectual digression. I said I'm teaching, I'm not lecture, I'm not preaching. Today is not preaching. This community worship is now teaching. In the same way, this is Paul to Titus. Encourage the young people to live wisely in all you do. And yourself must be an example to them by doing good deeds of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Let your teaching be so correct that it can't be criticized. Then those who want to argue will be ashamed because they won't have anything I want to ask you a question and I end there. If your enemy was very busy looking for you and he gets you, would he get room to find something wrong against you? Remember, we have enemies all of us. So how do you guard yourself that someone who is your opponent or your enemy when he finds you wherever, either in privacy or in public, you are the same. That is integrity. To God be the glory. May the Lord bless you.